thank you so much for coming this morning uh, to our first um, a tea with a spot of history since 2019. Yay! <laughs> All right, my name is uh, Lindsay Stewart Goldberg. I am the Visitor Services Associate here, as well as the Education Coordinator uh, on the Education Committee uh, with Bev Tyler and Donna Smith. And uh, I. Uh, don't want to uh, ramble on too long, uh, but I just uh, want to uh, uh, say um, thank you all for coming and uh, thank you to our speakers uh, for uh, coming uh, this morning to uh, talk about uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, both um, in uh, Long, on Long Island and uh, in Satake. Uh, so without further ado, I will um, uh, uh, leave um, with uh, our speakers, uh, lead, led by uh, Reverend Lisa Williams. Good morning, everybody. Good, morning. Good to morning. be here. Just to put your hearts at ease, I do have allergies that these masks make unbearable. So when you see me, that's what that is. We're going to open up first with, as I now know, uh, the There's a Talking Theme song led by Reverend Gregory. How many people know there's a Talking Theme song? <laughs> 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 there's a Talking Theme song. 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 Some churches didn't have their own pastor, so one pastor would go to different circuits. Well, uh, he went to a Methodist, how that went down, I don't know, but a Methodist um, service, and he was converted. Thereafter, he was determined to live a good Christian life according to the word of God. And that being said, he was a dutiful slave even thereafter. Uh, his owner noticing that, noticing how him and his brother conducted themselves and the morality of their life, then allowed them to invite Methodist preachers to his home that they might continue to conduct services. It was during that time that Sturgis himself was converted and realized the brutality of slavery and thus told uh, his Richard Allen as well as his brother that they would be able to purchase their freedom, which he was able to do um, in several years later. Once he had purchased his freedom, and that was around 1783, he began traveling Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. One of the cohorts that he met along the way was Absalom Jones, who was born in 1746 and died in 1818. 
when uh, Bishop, now I call him Bishop, but then Richard Allen was uh, around preaching when he was in Philadelphia, St. George's Church in Philadelphia. Here's the old church, or what I can glean is the old St. George United Methodist Church. They actually, actually licensed him to preach and asked him to be their 5 a.m. preacher. And so he conducted uh, services at St. George's Methodist Church for some time. However, uh, as way led to way, many people began to come because of Bishop Richard Allen. And because of that, the, the what was used to be a desegregated con congregation became slowly segregated. So much so that one day they asked uh, Bishop Richard Allen, while he was yet praying on his knees, they came and tried to forcefully remove Absalom Jones. Absalom Jones said to the trustee, uh, let me finish praying and when I'm done, we'll trouble you no more. During that time, actually, in April 12th, um, 1787, before the incident at St. George's happened, Absalom Jones, Jones and uh, Richard Allen formed what we know now as the Free African Society. This society was um, just a group of people that came together to meet the needs of all people, regardless of race or religion. They fed the sick, they clothed the, 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 the naked, and they uh, gave housing to the homeless. And it was just shortly after this that the incident at St. George's happened, where they were pulled literally off their knees. Here is just a short um, demonstration or... Um, Reactation. Thank you. <laughs> Reactment of what happened that was done some years ago in tribute to the life of uh, Richard Allen. You'll see where they are asking uh, here Absalom Jones to remove himself from his knees when he's praying. He turns around and says to them that uh, let us finish praying and we will trouble you no more. So after their prayer was finished, they got up off their knees and left St. George's, never to return in that capacity again. When they left, several or many of the members, not all of African American descent, left with them. It was from there, uh, that was 1783. In 1793, yellow fever epidemic hit Pennsylvania. Uh, Bishop uh, Frank Asbury asked Richard Allen if they would help by caring for the sick, by pulling the bodies out of the household. It was in this 1793 epidemic that 10% of the Philadelphia population was actually lost. In 1794, the blacksmith shop meeting house at Six and Lumber, what would later become known as Mother Meth Mother <laughs> Mother Bethel was dedicated. Frank Asbury was there to do the dedication ser services. One thing to note is the money to purchase this shop, to purchase this land. The blacksmith shop was in another location. They literally picked it up, moved it to this location and made it into a house of prayer. The monies used for that were received from all over. So even though we were still dealing with heavy discrimination, of course it's never a universal thing. I'm told that even George Washington actually sent money to help with this endeavor. 1794 to 1816, the relationship between Bethel Church and St. George's was up and down. Sometimes they were amicable, sometimes it was up in arms. Here's what the details were. Once they started services in 1794, Richard Allen was still very much a Methodist. He never wanted to deny what he had been taught or learned in the United Methodist Church. He just wanted a place to be able to freely worship, a place where whosoever would be able to come in and freely worship. As such, United Methodist Life AME is a connectional church. What does that mean? He was ordained an itinerant deacon. In the Methodist tradition, you need to be an itinerant elder in order to pastor. He was not afforded the right to be ordained an itinerant elder yet at this time. So he needed other ministers from St. George to come over and do services. Well, in this topsy-turvy relationship that they had, oftentimes the preachers that they sent were ill-equipped to preach. They would show up drunk, they would show up and not even preach and yet demand payment. So it was during this time that they tried to separate themselves from the United Methodist Church so that they can build their own congregation at which anybody and whosoever would be able to come in and worship. And it was in 1816 that they finally won the last lawsuit that allowed them to actually uh, separate from the United Methodist congregation. <clears throat> 
okay? However, uh, St. George considered, even though they had not paid for Bethel, considered it theirs and auctioned the property off. It's not as bizarre as it sounds because, like right now in the AME Church, if Bethel Setauket would decide they don't want to be a part of the Connection anymore, that church would still belong to the Connectional AME Church, and so they would have the right to come in and seize that property, even though there are other people worshiping there. So that's what happened here. They sold it off, and Allen was required to purchase it back at a whooping sum for that time of $10,125. On April 9th, 9th through the 11th and 1816, uh, the, 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 the legal organization of the African Methodist Episcopal Church happened in Philadelphia where they became incorporated. Understand that in this whole season there were many other factions of those who were no longer able to worship within their congregations that were rising up. So it didn't just start in Philadelphia, but it was also in Baltimore, Maryland. Bishop Allen went to speak to those and, and began two conferences, the Baltimore Conference as well as the Philadelphia Annual Conference when the 1860 organization um, began. In this time, Absalom Jones decided that he did not want to be a part, and it wasn't just him. It was a split. Some wanted to remain Methodist, and some uh, shifted to the Episcopal Church, was from the Church of England. Absalom Jones shifted. He became an Episcopal priest in the Episcopal Church, but they remained uh, with solidarity. Uh, in, in fact, Bishop Allen went to help them when they... Um, did the dedication for the Episcopal Church to show that there's no animosity here. Yes. What is Bethel? I, I don't know what that means. Bethel is house of God. It comes from the Bible where he says this place will be now called Bethel. This is the house of God. In 1819, William Lambert was commissioned by Richard Allen to plant a branch of the AME Church in New York because he had heard that there were other factions in New York that wanted to start their own uh, congregation as well due to some discrimination issues. The problem here is uh, he sent William Lambert to be the spokesperson for the AME Church. William Lambert came from New York. William Lambert was an AME Zion uh, a person who was pretty much ousted. So he came from being ousted and they sent the ousted member back to speak. So clearly this caused a lot of friction. So that's why now you have the AME Zion and the AME Church and they're not one. There was a time where they would have been birthed as one because the AME Zion Church did not birth as a legal institution until 1822. But because he sent the wrong man for the job, it never happened. Hostility began because of his presence. Um, in 1819, however, William Lambert did plant a church in New York. It's the church we now know today as First Bethel AME Church in Harlem, New York. On 136, 132nd Street is the present location of the church that William Lambert did plant some, uh, who, however many years ago that is. And uh, uh, March 26, 1831 is when Bishop Allen dies. Just to give you an understanding of what is the AME, what is the African Methodist Episcopal Church? Well, the A for AME stands for African. It means that the church was organized with people of African descent. But what it does not mean, which is also often not really understood, I think, by the masses, is that the church, it, it, it does not mean that the church was founded in Africa because it was founded here in these United States. And it also 100% does not mean that it is a church solely for persons of African descent. It is the church of God, and the church of God is always open to the whosoever. Amen? Amen. Okay. The M is for Methodists. Richard Allen believed that the Methodist doctrine of preaching the gospel was what was a simple way to transmit the word of God. That's why he did not want to shift to the Episcopal Church, but remain a Methodist. The church's roots are of the family of Methodists. If you look at the Methodist doctrine and discipline and our doctrine and discipline side by side, you can almost do a compare and there'll be minimal changes except for maybe in this century where our general conferences might have voted differently on certain matters. Methodism provides an orderly system of rules and regulations and places emphasis again on the plain and simple gospel. The E for Episcopal refers to the form of government under which the church operates, similar to the United Methodist Church. The chief executive and administrative officers of the American, of the African Methodist Episcopal Church denomination are the bishops of the church. Okay. Is there a test later? 
<laughs> There's not. I'm speeding because we have a lot to cover. Okay, but the main thing I always like to uplift is the word African does not mean it's for persons solely. Now, do, do a lot of Amy Church have a large um, number of African Americans in them? Yes, but that goes to location. If the location has a lot of African Americans in it, the church is going to. You know what I mean? We're neighborhood people, right? We're community people. Uh, the church is now. What started out, well, I'll just wait till I get to that slide. <laughs> the, motto, the motto for the African Methodist Episcopal Church is God our Father, Christ our Redeemer, the Holy Spirit our Comforter, humankind our family. Contrary to what many present day AMEs believe, this was our motto almost from the beginning. However, I don't know what year, but Bishop Daniel Payne decided to, to, to remove the line, Holy Spirit, our comforter. And so years we've been operating with the motto of God our Father, Christ our Redeemer, humankind our family. He removed it because he didn't, um, was not con connected to the spiritual outburst of things, so that was his modifier to remove the third person of the Trinity. However, in this century, it has been replaced. We serve a triune God, three in one, God our Father, Christ our Redeemer. Holy Spirit our Comforter with the reminder that humankind is our family. We are all one. The growth of the AME Church from 1816 to 1836, it started with seven churches, um, and in 1836 it was up to 86. The number of bishops in 1860 was one. Uh, however, in 1836 there were two bishops. The number of conferences started at two. Again, that was the Philadelphia Conference as well as the, Philadelphia, the, the Baltimore Conference. But in 1836 we now had four conferences, which were Western New York, which were inclusive of Utica, Rochester, and Buffalo, which opened the doors for it to also incorporate the five boroughs as well as Long Island. In 1836, that's when our growth uh, to the push to the islands and the other boroughs began. It also uh, included Canada. Canada became one of our um, conferences at that time. Understand that anytime we say a conference, like the Canada Conference, it's included of several territories. For instance, we are in um, the New York Conference. That's inclusive of the Jamaica Long Island ish District, as well as Brooklyn, Westchester, as well as Manhattan. Um, back then, Western New York included Buffalo, Niagara Falls, all the three that I just mentioned, as well as Long Island. Um, so anytime we just hear the Philadelphia Conference is comprised of many areas. And we're now in the First Episcopal District, which is comprised of seven conferences. The Bermuda Conference, the New York Conference, the Western New York Conference, the Delaware Conference, the New England Conference, the New Jersey Conference, and the Philadelphia Conference. Right now, the AME Church is on five continents and located in 45 countries. So we have AME Churches in France, we have AME Churches in India, we have AME Churches in many places of the globe operating under the doctrine and discipline of the AME Church. Amen. And now, we will shift to the AME Church in its move into Long Island. It was founded, the Bethel AME Church was founded in 1848, but it's not the oldest AME Church on Long Island. The oldest is actually Bethel Huntington AME Church, which was founded in 1843. But now I'm going to turn this presentation over to uh, whosoever, Brother Lewis or Reverend Leonard, who will talk about some of the significant members and the impact that they have made over the years at Bethel Setauke. <laughs> so you could just watch the screen. We're going to do first uh, the members uh, from the beginning, 1848 to 1930. Their names are on the screen. Again, these are the members that made a significant impact because it takes a village to do any work. And these are the ones that put their hands to the plow, making a significant impact. And I'd like to uh, just begin as we talk about Bethel Satawka in particular. The strength of the church is the community, and the strength of the community is the church. They work together, and I've served here for, uh, at Bethel Satawka for 25 years, and I've, um, <clears throat> we've built bridges and relationships you know, uh, that brings us together as a community, and that's the, um, the strength of 
Bethel Church in Bethel Church Setauket in particular. Um, the early members, uh, Robert, I, I know that you could probably um, talk of that. I've been here for just 25 years, not... 26. <laughs> uh, early members uh, yeah, on your program, and you read the, uh, the list of names there. Um, the founding uh, of the AME Church in Stony Brook, um, the names, there are four names here that uh, relate to the founding of that church in Stony Brook, which is probably predates 1848. Um, and those names are Richard Ackley, Abraham Tobias, David Tobias, and Jacob Tobias. And I believe uh, at that time that church that was established there was an AME sign. Um, but the, uh, there, for, for reasons that are not clear and not really established as to why certain trustees of that Zion Church became AME trustees. Uh, and these four names that I just mentioned, uh, the ones who uh, bought and purchased land at the present location where the uh, AME Church is in Setucket, and it was but the, orig the original uh, founding is 1848, but the church was not actually built and established with a cornerstone until 1874. Um, the other names are uh, that you see on the uh, list of names there uh, were significant members uh, to kind of use the term, push the plow to get the uh, uh, church up, up and running. And several were trustees. I don't know exactly who who, who were trustees and of the church at that time. But you may have heard of uh, one or two members uh, by the name of Levi Phillips, mm -hmm. and um, who traveled throughout Long Island. And uh, some considered him to be a medicine person, a medicine man. But he was instrumental in the church also, as well as was. Uh, James Lewis. So anyway, that's how the uh, Christian Avenue Church uh, has its beginnings, and um, things went on from that point. And one of the things that you can see is that women have been very instrumental in the church, in the survival of the church, whether it's you know working on the boards or whatever, or you know. Um, fundraising or whatever, they, you know, their heart was in the church. And it's interesting that in the mid-20th century, beginning at 1940 and forward, uh, there's one name down there that I remember, and that is Emma Bunn. She was an older lady and retired and pretty much housebound, but I remember her. But as we go through the other names, George Boykin, who was instrumental. Um, That's the 20th century. Yeah, the 20th century. George Boykin was instrumental in the stained glass windows being, you know, um, placed in the church along with all of the other members who um, took part in that effort. Um, uh, James Edwards, uh, and here we have Robert Lewis in the flesh. <laughs> uh, all of these people were a part of the story of Bethel AME Church, and uh, they were the ones that um, <coughs> made the church work and, and worked hard in the church. Um, one of the, um, the bottom picture, Alan Mulberry, he was the pastor steward when I came here. 25 plus years ago, <laughs> you know, and he was very instrumental in me, you know, becoming a pastor at Bethel Amy Church. But the thing that I want to say, we see all of these pictures and whatnot and different events in the life of the church. And as I said before, we have to say that the women were very instrumental in the life of the church Amen. and seeing that the church 
uh, survived. And one name that um, that we don't have here, but I want to mention, is James Hobbs, who is, um, and we'll probably come to that in a second, but these were people who um, made the church work, and uh, the church was the lifeblood because in many times there weren't other social avenues where they could, you know, participate in, so the church was the heartbeat, the church made the difference, and... Um, that's the members of the church mm -hmm. from the mid '40s up until you know today. And when you go to the graveyard, you see many of those names that you see um, that we flashed on the board. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. Uh, and um, is that the graveyard? The yeah, Laurel Hill. Mm -hmm. Laurel Hill. And there's that's, one down the road. That's the Bethel Cemetery. Right. And then there's also Laurel Hill Cemetery across the street. Yes. One, one thing about that Laurel, I mean Bethel Cemetery, and there used to be a church there. I think the church was half the size of this room. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was a church. It was a place of worship. And I think it... Um, burnt down and then they purchased the land further up on Christian Avenue where the church is presently and um, continued worship there. So that's the Laurel, um, Laurel Hill Cemetery and Robert, you want to <coughs> share with us the uh, Irving Hot Post? Or? Well, to, to be able to connect that um, very hard post to uh, at Miami Church. It's not, not hard to do. But there's always been a very significant relationship between the two, the church and the Irving Heart Post, since most of the, a lot of the members of the post, members of Bethel Miami Church. Uh, the Irving Heart American Legion Post would traditionally have a service back to God at Bethel Miami Church, so there was a strong relationship there. And often the uh, former pastors of uh, Bethlehem Church would hold certain events at the American Legion, and the American Legion would hold events at Bethlehem Church. So there's uh, a, uh, a family relationship there. Now, um, the American Legion post uh, in, of course, in the church has its has its own history relative to the. Uh, men and women who served in the armed forces. And um, they, that church, that, that, I'm sorry, that, that post is there because there was discrimination in the early 1940s where the uh, servicemen returning from overseas found it difficult to uh, participate in the existing post. So this one was uh, formed. And we got land by another church uh, person who was uh, a strong member of Bethlehem Church as Rachel Hart Young. Uh, provided some land. The building began in, uh, in the uh, 1950s. So the, uh, that's the basic connection for that building. Um, any other questions on that? There was recently some repair to the building? Yes. Uh, Thanks, Brother Lyons, Tom Lyons. Tom, did you have some comments on that? <laughs> not, not too many. Yeah, that's the beginning of a community gathering around around the restoration of, of the post. Okay. Uh, Long-term goals still have been determined in time frame, but uh, we have at this point rescued it from any kind of damage. Uh, interior has been uh, cleaned out. We have not appealed anywhere for extra funding or anything else because we had enough to do what we needed to do. And I would like to point out that Allison... Stop, stop, don't do that. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll, there's someone else who works right now. We haven't really been in beyond the dormant stage of just making sure everything is secure, do some planning and, try, and reaching out for some, uh, hopefully some substantial grants that will help us along mm -hmm. the way. We did. Uh, Part of that is because of a man named Hub Edwards, is, who's the commander mm -hmm. now still. He's 93 years old and a little old-fashioned sometimes. He says, I don't want to do one of those things online and do with the, you know, <laughs> with her, I don't remember that, you know, make a wish chair kind of thing. He says, I want to write thank you notes to everybody at his and $10. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of thing he's saying. But 
He's a great. He's a great man. He's been a commander for years and years, mm -hmm. and really in partnership with Brookhaven Town, taking care of the maintenance and, and everything at at the cemetery. So the cemetery officially belongs to uh, the town. It was start, established by the town in 1815, I believe. Yeah. But always has been maintained. Just one of the extra things that that uh, Bethel Church has done for this community. In a sense, they worked together through the the partnership with the Legion Hall. So. Mm -hmm. A lot of wonderful the, stories there. The relationship that we have with the Legion Hall and uh, in the Legion Hall with the community and the church shows that people working together can accomplish much. Yes. You know, and I think that's an important uh, aspect. And, uh, reality that we have, you know, at Bethel, you know, uh, we have God's blessings, but, you know, God blesses people in the community to be support and encouragement for the things that we, uh, we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. one, um, one thing that was explained to us, you know, by Hub and by Helen Sells about the history of the hall and, is that, um, one, it's really a symbol of self-determination because when there was discrimination, the members got together and they did it on their own. And it's, it was, um, the land was given by an African-American woman who had resources and then the, the hall has been was so successful for so many years and that was really because of the membership there. So it's a beautiful testament not only to the sacrifices that were made by the people of color who served in the military. I and mean, if you ever have the chance, the privilege to go inside, the walls are full of pictures of people mm -hmm. of color who have served in the military. And when you think about the segregation in the military and then the conditions that many of these people faced when they returned, but yet like that, that strong patriotism and that continuing service mm -hmm. is just I mean, for those of us on, who have just learned about it from the members, it's so inspiring and it's such an amazing um, building and history that to be preserved and cherished by this community. So we're hoping that with the restoration and all of that, that history will become Absolutely. known. I agree with you because I just got here and I was only able to go in once. And so I'm hoping those photos can be restored. Yes, yes, they're all right now. Well. They're being preserved. And Ooh, okay. it's only the one of two, I believe, African American, American Legion halls on Long Island. I think there was one in Amityville. But the beautiful thing is that even the, in the membership, in the charter, there was one person who was not African American who joined in related to Tom over there, and then it was always, my understanding, a place where, for mixed race gatherings, and when you look at the pictures, it's people of different races coming mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. and I just think that's, like, so unfortunately rare these days and so important, it's just, a, it's a very special place. Yeah. Uh, uh, just received from interview with Carlton Edwards and Chris Matthews regarding the Urban Heart American Legion Post. In 1950, the Legion received a charter for the Irving Hart American Legion Post, 1766. They needed 15 charter members. They could only find 14 people of color. So they invited Ralph Lyons, a European-American veteran of the Navy in World War I, to join them. Names of founding members are written in calligraphy on a chart in the Legion Hall. The list reads like a directory of the Christian Avenue neighborhood, George Brown. Arnold P. Bunn, Edward A. Calvin, George Fowler, Harry H. Hart, Warren Hart, William B. Hart Jr., Herman Lee, Ralph S. Lyon, August Midget, Alvin L. Scott, William S. Sells, Charles C. Stewart, Andrew F. Thomas, and Robert Treadwell. Thank you. That's that's wonderful, and thank thank you all. We're going to go ahead and move along, and we're going to then reserve questions till the end, just so that we don't run out of time. If you want to talk about the Mary Edo House and the Hawkins House, which preceded, um, I believe, Building Bridges, not Building Bridges, Higher Ground, which is instrumental in the preservation of the now Mary Edo House, Brother Lewis. Here we go again. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, I think um, there is a significant connection here. Um, uh, we're talking about um, 
two aspects of in in inventory. One is cultural, and the other is uh, a structural structural inventory, which is related to uh, Bethlehem Church. Now, um, <clears throat> the first structure that got higher ground started, initiated, activated, was a, a structure built by uh, Richard Hawkins, I believe, in 1860. And, it, and uh, I watched the bulldozer take it down. And so that caused high ground to become an organization, obviously. Uh, and that uh, this is uh, the retention of our historic uh, inventory is, 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 is important um, in, uh, in the sense that it's, it's connected to the people who must who have a place that they call uh, a place of presence. So, <clears throat> and uh, we, uh, the organization Higher Ground was formed and uh, we've been active in also trying to increase the, uh, the cultural significance that's related to the Bethlehem Church. And I don't have to go into that to tell you why that's, why that's always been that way. And uh, there was another attempt to remove another important structure uh, in, uh, on the, in the Christian Avenue Historic District, which, by the way, High Ground was able to form a petition to the town of Brookhaven. And in 2005, the area where the church is located today became a historic district and the church became a part of the uh, uh, town, uh, recognized as a landmark in 2009. But anyway, um, the history uh, is important. I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to be up here long. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, know that, we know that history is important. Um, we, we say it's the past, but it provides us with a means to go forward. So we looked at certain structures for their instruction in our lives that they had to be retained. Uh, this is not just to, uh, to create a structure so that you can rent them out to make money. Well, we've got to pay bills too. But so in, uh, eight, in 20, um, let's see, did I move too fast? I'm trying to move fast. And, uh, <laughs> in 20, uh, I believe it's 17. 20. 2013, uh, the uh, church was, uh, Bethel was uh, very instrumental in acquiring the uh, uh, Mary Ito, David, Reverend David Ito, and Mary Baker Ito. Um, she was, uh, um, let me just give you a little brief quick about, about her, but the house is significant and its history is attached to slavery. And this is in the, around the time of 1865, Mary Baker Ito, who became the wife of Reverend David Ito, who was pastor of Bethlehem Church and Port Washington Church also, and two other churches, which gives you some idea of the growth of the Amy Church. But Mary Baker Ito's parents were Oliver and Catherine uh, Baker. Uh, <laughs> They lived on the Baker Plantation, what can I tell you? That's why their name's the Baker. So, and, always, so. mm -hmm. and their, uh, their daughter, Kat, uh, uh, Mary, was uh, uh, bright, must have been very bright, and I believe that her, uh, her owners probably said, well, uh, you need to go to college, which she did. And um, she left the uh, Troy, South Carolina for New York, and uh, she met David Ito, Reverend David Ito. Uh, they married and uh, came to talk it, I believe, in uh, 1900, 1903. Yeah, 1903. And uh, they settled there and lived there until 19. Uh, Reverend David Ito lived there until 1955. Um, we won't go into details uh, about how we got. Bethel was able to do this quite, this church was quite a story. Um, but it's not the building. Uh, I always, for me, it's a history and what it speaks to. Um, 
And I don't have to mention to you uh, the longevity uh, of a lot of these, uh, of our African Methodist physical churches uh, had a lot to do with uh, whether or not there was some cultural uh, continuity, cultural validation, so forth. Thank you. So this is the Mary Edo House before, and he, Brother Lewis can correct me if I'm wrong, but Brother Lewis, who's the founder of Higher Ground, is extremely in instrumental in helping us to get the Mary Edo House to how it is today. Am I showing the right pictures, Brother Lewis? You can let me know. Uh, so at least it's stabilized. There's a lot more that needs to be done to make it a usable building and to have the cultural continuity. So it definitely took a village, right? It wasn't just Bethel, but Bethel along with the partnership with Higher Ground. Talking where, where is that? It's, uh, Christian? it's on Christian. It's 45 Christian Avenue. 46. 46. <laughs> That's why they're with me. Okay. <laughs> Time to tell lies. 46 Christian Avenue. Thank you. This is Reverend, as he mentioned, Reverend da David Edo, who was one of the pastors of Bethel talking. And again, it takes a village. And if you want to speak briefly, Reverend Leonard, regarding building bridges in Brookhaven, another community organization that's come alongside. I think this is uh, a very important event and organization. Um, Many of you have heard of the shooting that took place at Mother Emanuel down in South Carolina. And um, it affected us. We're so many miles away from South Carolina, but it still affected us because members of our congregation had relatives in Mother Emanuel who were killed. And uh, we, we were stunned. We were uh, wondering what to do. And... You know, it was a number of the churches in the community that said, let's get together and have a prayer service. Let's get together and begin to dialogue. And um, Brother Tom Lyons um, was instrumental. He's from Mount Sinai. And that's where we had a first, our first gathering. And as we gathered together and we talked with each other, we talked about the importance of communication and building bridges to one another. I had, um, as chaplain up at the Long Island State Veterans Home, I w had a uh, worker um, who told me that he lived on Long Island growing up. And he, you know, predominantly um, in a white community. And he never had a relationship with a black person until a youngster, a black youngster, joined the Little League team that he was on. And a relationship began there. And that's what we saw, the importance of building bridges to one another. Um, and um, building bridges is very instrumental in, um, in community events. And we every year strive to have a celebration around Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday and also recognize and the connection we have with the um, Mother Emanuel event and coming together. So I think the greatest thing is that the truth is we need one another yes. and we need to build bridges because when we build bridges to one another, uh, that's when positive things can happen. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when, as we build bridges, we won't have people asking, that's an Amy Kurtz, can a white person go in there? Yes! <laughs> Come on in! And uh, one of my hopes um, that connected to the Three Village Historical Society is that um, as you begin to, you know, have your annual events and whatnot in observance of the spy ring and, you know, the um, uh, graveyard thing. Throw the net a little wider and pull us in also, because I think we have people at the church who would be happy to um, share with the greater community and the community that the historical society brings together. Mm -hmm. the history.
history of um, black people here in Setauka. Amen. 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 Um, See how crowded it is here, so obviously people are interested. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was, I was on wait list to get here. There's obviously a lot of interest. So. Yeah. Yeah. And as it starts with one or two or three or four, mm -hmm. it starts with a dinner, it starts with a, you know, a responding, and, you know, today, um, they said that this was supposed to be National Hate Week or something. Did you hear? Anyone no, hear I that? Didn't hear that. Yeah, yeah, they That's were horrible. going to um, intimidate our Jewish brothers and sisters. Yeah. And um, there's a lady said, instead of making it National Hate Week, they wanted to say, we'll turn it around and make it National Love Week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, that's why it's important for us to come together. Amen. As we get ready to close, uh, we do have the Bethel Hobbs Farm, but we'll be back in June mm -hmm. to discuss that in more detail. I did have a slide, but I think, are we at time? We're just about at time. About, yeah. yeah, so uh, if you want to talk briefly about the Bethel Hobbs Farm, uh, Reverend Leonard. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, that's in the time that I've been here, in the 25 years I've been I knew and was introduced to Brother Alfred Hobbs, and um, he had 11 acres of property, of farm property that he had purchased, and with the help of the greater community, once again, um, people caring and helping one another. And as he grew older, he didn't have any, you know, um, offspring or, you know, descendants connected. And he wondered, I have all this 11 acres, but, and I'm going to meet my maker, you know, soon. What do I do? And because he was, you know, the church reached out to him and he reached out to the church. Uh, he, you know, in his will, you know, gave the 11 acres to um, Bethel Amy Church. And um, in doing that, many people came and said, sell the land, put houses on it. <laughs> but we wanted to keep his heritage alive and his name alive. So with the help of a young woman down in Center Reach, Ann Pellegrino, and Brother Peter, who still works there. Uh, Tom was involved with that. Brother Corbett uh, here. Brother Corbett, Brother Larry Corbett. Mm -hmm. uh, the farm is a working farm, and it's feeding people. Mm -hmm. And I think it, that makes a tremendous difference. We had a mind to not go after the money but to go after the service that the farm could provide, and it does provide. Brother Corbett and uh, others are there uh, often. Um, <laughs> Where is it located? It's located in Center Reach. Oh, okay. um, it's not once far. you go over um, 97 and 347, you take the first right and then the first left. It's on Ox Hill. Uh, Oxhead Road. 178 Oxhead Road. Uh, Larry, do you have it? 178 Oxhead Road. And uh, the farm is just another example of what is being talked about, how the community at large has come together to uh, create a better benefit to the community at large. So there was a point in the uh, life of the farm where it was in uh, significant disrepair. And a lot of our white brothers and sisters came and help to restore the farm. And so now today the farm is a significant example of how color is no longer an issue. People of all races and colors come together for the benefit of the community by providing uh, food that's free of charge to all types of soup kitchens. And, uh, organic. Yeah, organic. <laughs> and uh, we have a number of events at the farm also that's besides just farming, where they're just purely for people to come together of all races, all religions. And so we definitely uh, hope this year that we will continue to get the message out about the farm so you'll come and be a part of the farm experience this year. He's, he's a tremendous benefactor. And, uh, he really helped the church to strengthen its stand and to step forward. And 
making a difference. And, you know, the farmer is an example of his generosity and kindness. Mm -hmm. It's uh, also one of the few um, acreages in the farmland preservation program for Suffolk County that actually grows food. That's what they said. Not one. <laughs> well, there are, uh, there's a lot of farmland preservation, like the Detmer Farm up here. They do surface of uh, uh, surface farming. It's all flowers and uh, other things, and that's between that and sod and all yeah, the other do. types of things. Mm -hmm. um, is this is, is one of the few. <laughs> Actually, the number one use of the farmland preservation program in uh, Suffolk County is greenhouses and flowers. And so the farm also comes into play. It's cultivating all lives by planting seeds of hope and service. We do that through planting literal seeds in the at the farm. We do that by planting the seed of the Word of God. And it's done through praying for other people as well as helping other people in community as we are able. And so as we close this presentation of Bethel of the AME Church as well as its presence here at Bethel AME as a talk it, you'll just see on the screen uh, the pastors that have pastored here over the years. I think one day one of the projects will be to see if I can find pictures of all of these persons. Some might not be possible, but surely some are available in someone's home somewhere. Mine, mine is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, because it is the AME Church, you, we are at the um, ple we move at the pleasure of the of the bishop as he appoints people. Uh, Bethel has been blessed to have a pastor here for the last, I'll say, twenty six, twenty five plus. The the record books of history will tell us <laughs> later on. But to have him here for so long, as you see, there were others that were a little bit more transient. And so here we have the last three pastors. I do have their photos. Our, uh, Reverend Joanne Owings, who is now the presiding elder of the entire Jamaica Long Island District. So she governs the 20 churches in the Jamaica and the Long Island area. Our own beloved Reverend Gregory L. Lennon, who's here lies in the flesh, as well as myself. So we thank you for having us, Three Village uh, Societies, Three Historical Village Society on today. And we thank you for coming, and we hope that you were blessed in some way, informed in some other way. Amen? Amen. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.